so cholesterol is an important thing. We all have to have cholesterol, okay? We know that. Um, uh, and most people who are following a low carb, high fat diet, most people will not have significant changes in their cholesterol. You have a subgroup of people who have significant improvements, and you have a small group of people who get worse. Most <coughs> of the time we hear a lot about cholesterol getting worse, um, and they tend to, I will tell you, this is anecdotally, they tend to be um, thinner patients who are exercising a lot. That's typically what we see. And so the question we always have to ask, if we have anyone whose cholesterol is increasing, okay, um, is this a risk for the person, okay? And I will tell you, I take the cholesterol issue incredibly seriously, okay? Um, I actually am a board certified lipidologist, so believe me, okay? Um, I like to talk about cholesterol. <laughs> um, and I like to talk about it with the people who are the most important people to talk about it with, which is the patient. If they have a lab where cholesterol has risen, what are we gonna do about it? Ultimately, the question is, does this present and pose increased risk to me, okay? And so one of the first things I always want to ask the person is what kind of lipid test did you have, okay? Because if we're basing some sort of treatment decision on someone, especially someone who has a history of not having perfect metabolic health, and we're just going by the lab LDLC, which stands for LDL cholesterol, we may be totally missing the boat on risk, okay? In a lot of people who have had a history of insulin resistance, it is much better to be assessing risk with something called LDLP, LDL particle number, or ApoB. So instead of telling us how much cholesterol the particles are carrying as a whole, it actually tells us much more importantly how many particles that could potentially be problematic are there in general, right? And what we see very often in people who have insulin resistant history is that there's a really big mismatch. So they may have perfect LDLC, just looking at the total cholesterol carried by all their particles. But what we find when we look at LDLP is that their LDLP values are through the roof. That cholesterol is being carried by way more particles than it should be. That's a hallmarker of insulin resistance. So if we judge a cholesterol panel in anyone with insulin resistance just by LDLC, we may be missing the boat. We may be underestimating or overestimating the risk. So we always want to get the big picture. Let's find out how many particles you have. And like I said, most <coughs> people who are following a well-formulated ketogenic diet see an improvement. And if anyone wants the paper on that, that one's already published, okay? <laughs> so we'd be happy to send it to anyone who'd like to share that paper, okay? Um, but again, we at Verda really believe in treating each patient as an individual, and we don't go by averages, okay? So even though when we see and we take a look at the cardiac risk factors in our study patients, what we see is unbelievable improvements across the board, except for a slight increase in that LDLC number. But when we look at the ApoB or the LDL particle numbers, those have actually decreased. Not necessarily statistically significant, but remember, they're not getting worse. So we've had immense cardiovascular risk improvement, great diabetes reversal, and we're not making those typical risk factors worse. So I believe in having a real discussion with your physician about this. Anyone who just walks in and hands you a prescription for your cholesterol without having a discussion and maybe taking a moment to get the test needed to get a full picture, you need to find someone else to talk about this with, okay? It's really important. It's called shared decision making, and it is critical. And if I'm sitting down with a person to make a shared decision, made, me, the shared decision making decision, I need to have all of the data. 
So in my, in my uh, book, that means having those LDL particle numbers known. And in some cases, it even means getting a coronary calcium score to assess. So don't go just by LDLC because you're missing the whole picture big time. And once again, it can be a picture of underestimating or overestimating risk. And what we see is physicians say, oh, their LDLC is 70, I'm fine, without realizing that their LDLP is completely out of control. I just want to point out that on the Virta blog, we have a subsection called uh, Research and Science, and that's written uh, by Jeff Bullock and myself, and now we've added Dr. Brooke Bailey, who's over here on the side as our senior writer who's joined us to keep Jeff and me in line <laughs> in writing these things. But we posted a piece on blood lipid That's changes. That's a really hard job, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we posted a, a thing on blood lipid changes with a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And I think we put it up in it, probably April of, of this, this year. Uh, and it's uh, got enough technical information. Hopefully most of you can read it and, and figure out what we're saying, but it has enough technical information and references that you can share that with a, with a physician and say, There's, here's the verdict position on this topic. So, and for many things, the, the piece on sodium and, and you know, salt intake is there. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions. Maybe you're going to get to it on thyroid and thyroid function and on the ketogenic and things. Most of these hot and button points we have or will soon be posting these statements um, uh, uh, on, the, on the Verta blog under the, the science and research subheading. 